Welcome back. Now, let's dissect this issue of uh, the interim national government now from the legal perspective. I'm now being joined on the program by GTO Ogunye, who is uh, a legal practitioner. Mr. Ogunye, thank you very much for joining us on the program. Um, help us to understand this. Does the Constitution, as it is today, does it make any provision at all uh, for the, the install, installation, if you like, or for the setting up of an interim national government. What, what, what exactly does, does our law say about uh, interim national government? Now, Nigeria is a, thanks for inviting me. Uh, unfortunately, this matter has become topic in the recent times. Huh. And many people are wondering what's really, really going on. Uh, Nigeria can recall that before now, the idea that some persons in government or in the polity who have forever been playing the game of power uh, were contemplating foisting an interim national government on Nigeria uh, have been made known to Nigerians. Um, Governor of Cardinal State, and I verify, alluded to that. And people just thought that uh, that was a rumor, or that that was just a uh, political mischief or speculation. Mm. Uh, however, with uh, the director of state, uh, directorate of state security service coming forward now to uh, authenticate that report and to affirm that indeed some political actors were working assiduously towards foisting an interim national government on Nigeria, thereby truncating Nigeria checkered mass towards democratic consolidation. Uh, the matter had left the realm of speculation, and people are, 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 are worried uh, a great deal. Nigeria is a constitutional democracy, albeit imperfect. Hmm. And the constitution by the provision of section one, subsection two, states clearly that the federal government of Nigeria uh, shall not be taken over by any person or group of persons except as it is provided in the Constitution. Yes. Meaning that the provisions governing subsection to power and power ascendancy at all levels in Nigeria have been well spelled out in the Constitution. And those provisions are the only legitimate, legal, and constitutional route accessing to power. Uh, the Constitution does not, in any of its provisions, uh, makes any arrangement for an interim national government. Okay. As a stopgap or as uh, a filler of any interregnum. Let me just say clearly that, and it is important, and I thank you, Deji, for inviting me. Uh, it is important that we let Nigerians know particularly young people, what this whole concept of interim national government is all about and where it is coming from. During the military era, we had a president. And that president uh, didn't bode well for the Nigerian people. Uh, in 1993, the federal military government annulled the June 12, 1993 election, won by Chief uh, Moshud Kajima Wabiola and the Social Democratic Party. Now, a lot has been said about that election. After the annulment, there was a major political crisis in Nigeria, with Nigerians being up in arms against the military and stating that the military must go. Now, the military president of that era, General Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida, has spent about eight years in power. And 
had perpetually extended his handover date. In the meantime, we already had at that time a 1989 constitution, meaning that originally, under his transition to civil rule program, he should have left power in 1989. But he kept changing the dates. He kept changing the dates until uh, 1993. And that was why a lot of people, including Larry Diamond in the seminar work, uh, stated that it's, uh, a transition without end and the highway to nowhere. Anyway, that election was an odd, and there was also uh, a lot of upheaval in the military uh, with a lot of people who had stayed the cause with him, who had governed with him, also feeling that it was their turn to have a fight. So uh, it wasn't only Nigerian civilians that were insistent on Babangida leaving. Even in the military, there was a groundswell of position that he should leave. So what did he do? He took advice from a former military head of state in Nigeria at that time, who was saying that uh, Abiola was not the missile that we wanted, and who was suggesting that he could help to have an interim national government. But he took the idea, he didn't take the person. I'm talking about President Ibrahim Abangida. So he took the idea, he didn't take the person. And so he chose Ivanes Shonekom, who is late now, God rest his soul, uh, who had uh, served in a darkical arrangement with him uh, while he was experimenting with Daki, who had served in his government as like more or less like the prime minister. He decided to make him the head of the interim national government. But to give it the veneer of legality and legitimacy, he embarked on a bizarre uh, amendment of uh, the laws, the governing laws at that time. The basic law of the military at that time was what was called constitution suspension and modification decree number one of 1984. That was the decree that Major General uh, Mamadou Buhari passed in Supreme Military Council in 1984 when he took over government uh, from Alaji Sewu Shagari as president. So it was called uh, Constitution Suspension and Modification Decree number one of 1984, basically suspending the provision of, 1999, of 1979 Constitution and modifying some aspects so that it will accord with military rule and military dictatorship. So where we have the National Assembly before, we now had Supreme Military Council. So in 1985, when General Bangida took over power, he amended that basic law by a decree, which he called Constitution Suspension and Modification Decree number 17 of 1985, which modified the 1984 uh, decree number one law, which Buhari came up with. And so to continue with his government, and he created an unforeseen ruling council. So it was that law, that decree, that vested legislative and executive powers in the military. And so it was that law they were using to govern. So when the crisis of June 12th then occurred and Bangra then wanted to leave and he wanted to force an interim national government on us, what he did was that he purported to amend and repeal the Constitution Suspension and Modification Decree Number 1 of 1984 as amended by the Constitution Suspension and Modification Decree number 17 of 1985, which was his own ground norm to pave way for the interim national government. So he signed a decree on the 26th of August, because it was to leave on the 27th of August. He signed a decree on the 26th of August, repealing that ground norm, that Constitution Suspension and Modification Decree. And on the same day, he enacted a new decree, which he called Decree 61, Interim National Government Basic 
Constitutional Provisions Decree Number 61 of 1993. So, and then on the basis of that, uh, Chief Enestuelecon was sworn in. Unfortunately, Chief M. Kuyabiola, unfortunately, Chief M. Kuyabiola, uh, sued neck then, that was the National Electoral Commission, mm. and others, and had that interim national government uh, declared illegal, simply by getting lawyers to come to court to say that by the Interpretation Act of Nigeria, Section 15 thereof, of that Interpretation Act, when you enact a law and you date it on a certain day, for example, the 26th of August, when that law was enacted, those two laws, Decree Number 59, by which Constitution Suspension and Modification Decree was repealed, and Decree 61, the Interim National Government Basic Constitutional Provision Decree, you know, that is sought to use to birth the existence of the Interim National Government, the effective time that decree will take effect is midnight of that day, meaning midnight of 25th to 26th. So what Babangida did by signing those two decrees concurrently was to have repealed his power to enact a decree. He repealed his basic law, and therefore there was a vacuum. Having repealed his basic law by decree 59, he couldn't have legitimately and legally made decrees to one which followed, which was the international government. And so on that basis, the court, the lack of Arkansas J of the High Court of Legal State of Blessed Memory declared the international government illegal and unconstitutional. Mm. And of course, the military wrote on that to start the international government altogether, and Abacha came to power. Now, some of the people who inspired that interim national government in that time are still alive and they are regarding. That's why I suspected that Ganduje once said that the June 12 forces are gathering again, you know, in one of his recent uh, uh, statements. Some of those forces are still alive and they are enamored of perpetually keeping power. They are not Democrats. Nobody in his right senses right now should be talking about an interim national government when Nigeria is just celebrating the fact that Ramshaku or no Ramshaku, perfect or imperfect, we now have 24 years of civil rule without military intervention. With the international community is indeed celebrating because on the African continent, our immediate neighbor like Mali, Burkina Faso, and some other countries had had, in recent times, military interventions. And Nigeria, which is regarded as the beacon of civil rule right now on the African continent, uh, you know what is going on in South Africa now, you know, uh, perhaps because of the sheer longevity of this experiment since 1999, you know, Nigeria that has been celebrated for that is now confronting the uh, possibility, and God perish that thought, that uh, some persons are thinking of an interim national government. Now, let me, let, uh, let, let me quickly ask you this. <laughs> let, let me quickly ask yes. you this. I, I, are, you, are you then surprised uh, when, uh, you know, ju just recently we saw video, we saw a video of uh, protesters now around the defense headquarters, literally asking the military to intervene? I'm not only surprised by that incident. I'm furious. I'm angry. I'm very disturbed. And there is no, you know, there is no real governance going on because so the people in government, and I'm using, I'm, I'm saying this very clearly. So the people in government have their accomplices. If I had the attorney general of Nigeria in my country, some people go out, go to defense headquarters, and they are saying military, come and save us, come and stage a coup. 
That is treason. That's treasonable felony at the least. And so I will order that those persons, if there are thousands of persons, be arrested. I will prepare charges. I will go to court as the attorney general personally with my retinue of law officers. And I will ask that they be remanded in prison pending the time we will complete their, it is, it is heresy. It is a taboo. It is something that ought not to be contemplated at all. There is no agitation. There is no feeling of being cheated politically that could warrant or justify any call for military coup. Indeed, it's an incitement and it's a violation of our law. They ought to have been arrested. I wonder why on that occasion, the military people didn't get them arrested. And said, we are a military authority, but we are going to arrest you and take you to civil authority because you are trying to incite military officers to subvert the constitution. That's treason. And so I went back to memory lane because some of these persons perhaps were too young and I'm not claiming to be too old or old uh, myself, maybe they were too young to know what we went through under the military. Indeed, their right to protest, which they are enjoying, is because we are a democracy. If we are under military rule, perhaps they will have been shot at for daring to go to the front of defense headquarters. Okay, so they shouldn't take liberty for license. It is horrible, it is condemnable, I condemn it. It is anti-democratic, it is grossly irresponsible. And let me say, I have the right to be angry. As a young lawyer in this country, right from the time we left the military, some of our colleagues are dead now. Shima Obani, Damidele Atru, and many, many others, many nameless, who fought hard for democracy in this country, who were denied our liberty. Some of us could even go to our workplaces because at a point, we all decided that what was the point in sitting down, lame dog, and then allow military to arrest you. That in the past, under the what, Bangida, yes, what do you, you arrest what, people. What, what you do just you, let what, me first answer the point. You arrest people and then detain them for five months. And Abaja came and was detaining people for four years and all that. People learn how to go underground. And so their work was disrupted. Some were killed, some were in prison. People like Boluade uh, Burua was, was locked up at the military facility in Apapa DMI for months. And some people who didn't even participate, they, was, they, were, they, were, they were young people then, or they were old, who never did anything. Some of the people running about town now, I never read it in their history that they fought for democracy in this country. One of the reasons for the protest we have seen, especially in Abuja, is that um, the protesters say that they do not want the president-elect to be sworn in yet until the case in court is concluded, and, and that they do not have confidence, for instance, in the judiciary uh, to dispense justice in, 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 this, uh, in this case. That's the petitions now uh, before the courts. And so... It's, it's the reason why they're going to the length uh, that they, they have actually gone to, like, inviting the military to take over and all of that. So I, I'm just wondering, what, what do you make of this argument that the president-elect should not be sworn in until all the cases in courts have been dispensed with? If there is no argument there. What is the argument? Does the Constitution provide that? If you oppose the result of an election, then the person who won the election should not be sworn in. Is that what the Constitution provides? The Constitution does not provide that. It does not provide that. And I just give you an example. Mm. In a number of states, in a number of states, Peter Abu won an election in 2003. 
after the Mbadiniju years. And Dr. Uh, Chris Ngigi uh, became the governor and was sworn in. And for more than two years, there was election petition. Mm. Uh, and then at the end of the day, it was concluded. So in other words, I'm saying that the arrowhead of the Labour Party, I don't want to take this person out, have gone through that route before. On that occasion, uh, mm. did he stop Christian from being sworn in? So I'm saying that there is a prescription of the rule of law. There is a constitutional route. That's how I started, mm. to accessing power and retaining power. It's not true anarchy. So when you then say that you don't trust the judiciary, who do you trust? All right. I, I think we just have to leave it there. We just have to leave it there. Mr. Jitugunye, thank you very much for your time, and thank you for talking to us. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. I will take a short break, and we'll be right back. Stay with us. Don't go away. Opinions are free. Facts are sacred. The truth is universal. How in practical terms? Can we, for instance, de-escalate the tension? President must see himself as the president of the Federal Republic. We know where the enemy is. Three places. Um, the Lake Chad region, the border area between Nigeria and Cameroon, and then the Sambisa forest. On DG360, we give you a complete dose of everything. Opinion, facts, and undiluted truths. I hardly believe what politicians say in this uh, part of the world. The new Nigeria is possible, the future is possible. We delve into the issues, dissect it, so that you can understand it, use it to take action. I don't think there's any need for go any governor to look for grant for ranching. Digi360, dissecting the issues. <laughs>